Welcome to the Master Circle Podcast. I'm Dr. Bob Hoffman, and each week we'll be bringing you the freshest, most cutting-edge information in chiropractic, wellness, personal growth, and success. All the systems, strategies, and philosophies you need to grow your practice and life can be found in these podcasts. Follow the links below to learn more about the Master Circle and everything we have to offer you. Please enjoy this podcast edition, and let's keep growing together. Now, we're going to shift into another gear here for the remainder of this class, because I promised you we we're going to look at some of the shifts in the key roles in a chiropractic practice. And indeed, this list is, is, is somewhat incomplete, because... Each of you is starting to evolve a new take on practice. Getting into brain-based wellness is not a matter of doing what the master circle says. Hopefully you'll do some of that. But what it really is is a key to understanding why what you've always done has worked or not worked when it's worked or not worked. Because every one of you has had amazing miracle cases, and every one of you has had people that you scratch your head and wonder why it didn't work as well as it should have. And my contention to you is that in many ways, uncovering the brain contribution to what was going on with that person is going to give you insight into what you might need to do differently next time. If you start to understand that D.D. Palmer knew all about this, he talked about trauma toxins and thoughts, you know, he talked about how auto-suggestion was a primary cause of subluxation and disease. He talked about toxicity as a primary cause of subluxation and disease. He knew what Dr. Barwell was saying. He knew that subluxation was secondary. It doesn't mean it's wrong. You still got to correct subluxations. I mean, the metaphor of the circuit breaker, if there's a problem in the power and it causes a circuit breaker to go off and you fix the power, but you don't fix the circuit breaker, the circuit's still not going to work. You got to do both. You got to reset the circuit breaker and you also got to fix the power. So you've got to adjust the spine and you've got to come up with the causes as to why that subluxation occurred in the first place. If you do that, you're a monster. You're a healing machine. If you can do that, then you're going to change lives in droves. They won't, they'll be fighting to get into your office. But some people do part of it, and some people do another part of it, and that's what team is about. We have to learn from each other so that we can all go forward with this amazing complement of healing abilities to change people's lives at the deepest level. So let's look at some of the roles that need to be fulfilled in today's chiropractic practice. Now, the first three roles I want to talk about are doctor roles. How many people here have read something by Michael Gerber? Great, most of you. I'm delighted because in our culture, we have pointed at Michael's work many times. I believe that he is one of the most profound of all the business teachers, not only because of his amazing systems orientation, but because he's such an incredibly genuine person who understands human nature. And I urge you to read his work. But the foundational work, the, the first stuff that he started teaching about was the E-Myth. E-Myth stands for Entrepreneurial Myth. And it points out the fallacy of thinking that because you're good at doing something that you can run a business that features that. The road to success is littered with people who thought that they could accomplish what they saw their bosses do. And it didn't turn out to be necessarily that easy. Because in your chiropractic practice, you definitely have to take care of people. But the taking care of people, oddly, is the lowest of the three denominations of what the sole proprietor in a business will do. The technical aspect of it is usually the first thing that you can start to delegate out. So we get so wrapped up in technique, and by the way, me too, I love technique. I'm a technique aficionado. But I learned that in order for me to play the other roles that needed to be played, I needed to take myself away from being a full-time technician so that I could engage in the next aspect of the role that a sole proprietor would play, and that would be the manager. The manager is going to oversee what technicians do. The manager is responsible for the operations to make sure that everything works smoothly. And in fact, in today's modern chiropractic office, especially solo doctor offices, most of the doctors are spending most of their time as technicians and some small portion of the time that's left over as managers. Now that sounds pretty good because they're managing and they're adjusting patients, pretty good, but the problem is the highest level of these three roles is the role of the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is the one who makes the decisions about what's important to that particular practice, sets the course. 
you know, the technician climbs the ladder that the manager has put up against the wall, but the entrepreneur decides which wall. And it's really important for you to recognize that if nobody's being the entrepreneur in your practice, because you're so consumed with being a technician and a manager, then there's a good chance that your practice is either stalled or stalling. And so many people come to me and say, you know, um, I'm flat. And it's like, okay, so what do you think is the issue? It's like, well, I need more new patients. Okay, so what do you got to do? Well, I got to go get some more new patients. Okay, how? Well, I'm not really sure. Okay, so then what you need is tools on how to get more new patients. No, I have those. Okay, then what aren't you sure about? I'm not sure what I need to do. Okay, but you have tools. Yeah, but I don't know how to use them. Okay, so we need to work on using the tools. Well, not exactly. Okay, so what is it that you really need? Well, I need to decide which of the tools are really important. Okay, so which kinds of patients are you aiming at? Well, I'm not really sure. And therein lies the rub. I'm not goofing around. I've had this conversation a thousand times if I had it once. And the thing is, is that you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. This is not a matter of you being defective. Nobody ever trained you on how to be an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur starts with the vision. I see a thousand visits a month. And I'm going to have a 50 PVA, 20 new patients, and 10 of them are going to be two families of five. And 10 of them are going to have three difficults and unusuals. I'm going to have three Medicare patients because I love to take care of the seniors. And I'm going to have three X factors, just people who are just going to come in. And one person is going to be my oh no patient. Why would you go for an oh no patient? You know who an oh no patient is, right? It's when you see the name in the appointment book and you go, oh no. Oh, no patients, right? Yeah, but they're your best teachers. People who are like me don't do real well with anger. We stuff it down, 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 and then somewhere along the line, it explodes volcanically, boom! And then we feel better, but there's wreckage, serious wreckage. So learning how to deal with anger was an important piece of my puzzle. It used to come out in road rage. It was such a safe place to be angry. I was in my car by myself. I could flip people the bird. I could curse them out. They never even knew. (laughs) Except I once put my fist through a windshield. That wasn't very fun. Um, I don't know how many times I sprained my wrist punching my steering wheel. Definitely not fun and really bad for chiropractors, not to mention guitar players. So I had to learn how to process that. And the way I processed it was I realized that those people who were driving too slow in front of me or too fast to pass me, they were my teachers. Now, when somebody's like driving 30 miles an hour in a 40 in front of me and there's a one-lane road and I can't get around them, instead of getting real angry, which I used to do, instead I say, thank you, teacher. You're teaching me patience. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I feel more patient now. Thank you. Thank you. You're so good to me. I really appreciate you. And then I laugh like you're doing because it's so absurd. But where's the anger? I'm not squashing it down. I'm expressing myself. Tools like this, you know, that you learn along the way. I mean, there's no particular technique, the Dennis Road Rage technique. (laughs) It's not that. It's just a matter of being present and figuring out how you can use what happens to your best advantage. So... Technician, manager, entrepreneur, it's really important for you to recognize that somebody in your office has to be the entrepreneur. Now, of late, when Bob and I are doing so much coaching, because we still have to be the entrepreneurs, we're working about 70, 80 hours a week because we're doing a lot of coaching and we are also working towards building our company. Well, that's something that we'd love to do but we realize that there's a sacrifice and we're willing to do the extra hours and the extra time, and the extra traveling in order to do what we need to do in order to keep our hands on the pulse and make sure that we can continue to serve you to the best of our ability. Now, technicians fall into a couple of different categories. A sole proprietor, like many of you are, are going to be the sole technician in the office. You're going to be the main person who does the adjusting. But you can also hire a staff doctor or a couple of staff doctors. You can hire an associate. An associate doctor can be, um, usually they they fall into one of two categories. I call clones and foils. Clones and foils. A clone is somebody who's kind of like you. Maybe similar gender, similar personality type, similar adjusting style, similar personality. 
A clone is usually your first hire because generally speaking, when you're looking for an associate doctor the first time, it's because you have too much work to be done. You can't do it all yourself. And you need somebody who's enough like you that you can take some of your work and put it in their column. So the first hire is typically a clone. Now, the other kind of associate doctor is called a foil. A foil is someone who's not like you. Different gender, different technique, different orientation, maybe slightly different philosophy, um, maybe expert in an area you're not expert in, nutrition or, or kinesio taping or sports or personal injury work or x-ray or whatever. You hire a foil when you want to expand the scope of your practice. You hire a clone when you want to expand the volume of your practice. You hire a foil when you want to expand the scope of your practice. You want to take care of more people or a different kind of people. So this is the way that you determine whether you need a clone or a foil. For most of you, the first hire will be a clone. Because the main reason most of you would be looking for an associate would be because you have too much work to do and you need somebody to help you with it. But you could hire an exam doctor. Or you can hire someone to help you with your paperwork. Or you can hire a specialist, a wellness specialist, or a rehab specialist, or a PI, or a sports or extremity specialist. Or you could take a medical doctor on your team, or an osteopath. You know, of late, we've been coaching a number of osteopaths in England, and then mostly like chiropractors. It's funny, the osteopathic profession kind of bifurcated. In the U.S., osteopaths went toward medicine, and in the U.K., osteopaths went towards chiropractic. So many of the osteopaths are practicing much like chiropractors. So we find it very comfortable to coach them, and they've been some amazing members. So that's the doctor team. I want to talk a little bit about the assistant team. Now, obviously, traditionally, front desk person, clinical assistant in the back office, business and collections, maybe a traffic flow or a floor CA. But these days, there are more roles that CAs are playing than ever. I mean, just the, the whole idea of marketing and social media, I mean, that didn't even exist when most of these ideas were formulated. So many CAs are acting as creative instruments, as people who are uh, making a legitimate contribution to the growth of the practice through the social media. Bob mentioned Anna Saylor gets 50 new patients a month through social media, and she doesn't do most of it. She's delegated the bulk of it. So we've delved into this. I'm curious. Uh, oh, I think I may have asked you yesterday, how many people watch my video blogs? Did I ask you yesterday? Right, okay, so like that's an example of taking YouTubes and throwing them out there. It's not any sales in there. I mean, my logo's on it, but there's no sales in there. It's basically about throwing great information out there and seeing what sticks. I have a lot of material. I can't possibly get it all into the stuff that I'm already doing, so I'm throwing it out there. That's one of the reasons I write my column, is to get as much material out there as I can possibly get. A staff liaison or an office manager. Traditionally, we've always felt that the doctor should be the office manager. But if the doctor is going to be the entrepreneur, there may be some management functions that need to be delegated, in which case you take a top flight CA and you start to train them to be able to do some management work. Now, I want to read a brief section for you. This comes from the message of the week in August of 2007. Investing in your staff so they look at their work like a career instead of a job not only improves your practice, it moves the profession in a healthy direction. The training process launches a small army of chiropractic ambassadors into our neighborhoods, equipped to discuss chiropractic intelligently and refined in their approach to daily office scenarios that might have previously been rough spots in their office flow. Purpose, self-esteem, and competence make a potent combination. In many cases, the staff has inspired the doctor to make corrections, to pick up the pace, to get more organized and push harder. Newly aware of the best ways to do things, they often make practical and profitable recommendations that increase volume and income and decrease conflict and stress. Staff, we definitely can't do it without you. We may at times be cranky. We may seem underappreciative at times. We may even be underappreciative at times. But staff, we can't do it without you. I mean, you're, you're the, the glue that holds the practice together. Now, you may already include staff training in your weekly game plan. If so, you would be commended. You can't spend enough time and energy training, as the world's finest businesses consistently demonstrate. You can structure your own staff training if you like. It takes some discipline, planning, and willingness to integrate it into your schedule, but it will return to you. Typically, there are two methods, and Bob talked about this yesterday. Depending on the situation, you can focus on weaker areas in the practice and spend extra time on those, or you can have a curriculum or syllabus that covers all relevant materials. Now, the reason why I want you to understand these concepts about team is because chiropractors by nature are lone rangers. We're rugged individualists. I confess to being a loner myself. But the fact is, 
you can't be a loner and have a successful practice. Somewhere along the line, you've got to engage people. And when you start to realize that everybody that you come in contact with has gifts for you, and you have gifts for them, and it's always Christmas, and you can always share, I mean, this is a way to live life that is just so joyous and so beneficial. You know, one of the reframes that helped me fix my road rage to reframe the morons, idiots, maniacs, and creeps that were on the road into people who were actually my teacher that I could learn something from, the leverage on that was the acknowledgement that everything that happens happens for a reason. It all serves me, but I have to be clever enough to see how. And I can't emphasize how important it is for you to acknowledge that even when ugly stuff happens, even when stuff happens that's painful or difficult, or you feel like you've been singled out or persecuted, why am I this way and everybody else is that way? Or you recognize that you're in some ways falling short of your ideal. I mean, this happens to everybody. Instead of feeling victimized by it, you have the opportunity to reframe it. What does reframing mean? Certainly you've taken a piece of art or a photograph and you took it out of one frame and you put it into another frame and it looked completely different. That's what reframing means. It means getting a different perception about something, noticing how it's different from what you originally thought so that you can recognize how it serves you. Because, look, Einstein said, well, I've quoted Einstein a lot this weekend, haven't I? Einstein said in the final analysis, the most important decision we have to make is do we live in a friendly universe? Because if you believe you live in a friendly universe, then you will live as if you live in a friendly universe. And if you believe you live in a hostile or unfriendly universe, then you will live as if you live in an unfriendly or hostile universe. This is the foundational stone. This is the cornerstone of a happy or an unhappy life. Whether we think that the environment is loaded with assassins or whether we think it's loaded with friends. Now, at varying times in my own personal life, I have to say I've gone back and forth. But at this point, I'm kind of old now. Not tired yet, but kind of old. I'm going to be 60 this summer. I'm a grandfather. As you, did I tell you I'm a grandfather? Did I show you pictures? If I haven't, I will. If I haven't, I will. I've recognized that literally, if it's to be, it's up to me. The only real choice that we have is deciding how we're going to live our lives. Am I going to live it all out and burn brightly like a flame and then flicker once and go out? Or am I going to stagger through life wondering why it isn't easier? And how could this happen to me? And why is everywhere I look people taking pot shots at me? You know, I've been vilified in print by the right and the left in chiropractic, by the progressives and the conservatives. I've had a lot of people call me names, things that I don't really even understand why they would think that of me. And there was a time when I got indignant about that, when I got angry about it. But now I recognize that everybody's on their path. Everybody's exactly where they should be, and so are you. So you need to make sure that you understand that you're surrounded by team. The vendors out there in the hall, those people are team. The chiropractor down the block, team. The patient who leaves angry and gives you an ugly review on Google, team. They're all part of your team. You probably know that not everybody plays at their best every single game, but they're still part of your team. And if you recognize that, and if you hold yourself to a high standard of execution in your own personal affairs, then it's inconceivable that you wouldn't move forward. Now, my final thoughts on this are as follows. The people you come in contact with are in your life for a reason. If you fight with it, you'll miss the opportunity. If you embrace it, then all the conflict evaporates and all you see is love. All you see is opportunity. All you see is the person who was sent like an angel to support you in your quest. And sometimes those angels don't look like what we expect. They don't have those like white coats and those wings. Sometimes they look like an oh no patient or somebody who's driving 30 miles an hour in front of you in a 40 or a patient who responds badly and tells everybody they know. Sometimes we get irate about that stuff, but our growth is not dependent on what they do. Our growth is dependent on what we do, and what we do is dependent on who we are. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Master Circle Podcast. Many of our podcast listeners ask about the source of these shows. Well, they come from seminars, teleclasses, interviews, 
and audio albums, many of which are available for purchase at the Master Circle Marketplace. Just go to www.themastercircle.net and look through our vast library of useful, practical, and inspiring audio materials. And if you'd like to attend one of our live seminars, just call us at 800-451-4514 and we'll be happy to register you. It's a pleasure to serve you and keep growing yourself and growing your practice.